This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the one who guided the wise men long ago by a star and still speaks to us, dear brothers and sisters. There are some historical stories that just fascinate people. And they wonder, could I know more details about that? I wonder if I could have seen that. I wonder what that would have been like. You know, for example, uh, the Titanic. I don't know if you ever follow the artifacts that are displayed with the Titanic that they've recovered. don't know if you ever read about the story or theories with what happened on that voyage, but it just mystifies people. And, and they wonder, what was that iceberg like? that may have struck the ship? And where, where would it have struck the ship to have crippled it? And what did the captain know? And when did he know it? How were the people reacting as they realized there was some grave danger on that trip? And as it began to sink, what would that sight have been like as it slipped below the waters? Just a couple weeks ago, I saw there's a new theory kind of going around about the Titanic Maybe you heard about it, that there's, there was a fire that was burning on the whole voyage that they couldn't put out, and it was really hush-hush, and so they were speeding through the waters, and the iceberg struck, guess where? Right where that fire was raging underneath the deck. But regardless, people have questions, and the mysteries go on. The Bible has some accounts like that, too. The Bible has some accounts where we don't have too many details and we, we really have questions like, what, what was that like and what would have been like to see that and, and how did that work? And I, I surely think that the wise men is an account like that. Just 12 chapters in the book of Matthew where we see some mysterious facts given to us and it really leads to some questions with what that day was like when they visited Today, as we recount that, as we celebrate Epiphany Day, we don't want to get caught up in some of the speculation or the mysteries or the questions. We really want the spotlight to be where it should be. And so let's today consider five Epiphany points to ponder that really hit to the heart of the matter and really keep the spotlight where it should be. To do that, we're going to use the classic star the epiphany star that uh, is often seen in, in pictures of the wise men coming to Christ. And we're going to fill in five points and briefly learn what we should never forget about that first epiphany. The first point we look at in verse 1 where it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. The first thing we focus on are the visitors. Now, we don't know all that we would like to know about the visitors. Who were these men? Well, it says magi. That doesn't help us too much. That's just the Greek word that's listed there. Magoi, magi came. And it can be translated educated ones, scientists, it can be translated studiers of the stars. It can even be translated priests. Some type of educated position, though, fascinated by nature. And we, we get the word magic from it, the word magician. Who were these individuals? The book of Daniel might give us the best clue. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, it says, The king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. And in Daniel 5, King Nebuchadnezzar appointed Daniel chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Daniel carried out his ministry and lived his life in Babylon, in exile. And as he lived there, he had an impact and an influence on their educated ones, even their magicians and sorcerers. The king threw him into that group. He became a, a leader, an influence per, uh, influential person there. And Daniel, it seems, may have instructed them on this Messiah that was to come through his own nation. He may have instructed him about them about that star that would rise, as the book of Numbers says, the one from whom the scepter would not depart from Judah. 
And it seems that they, this may have had an influence on them. We don't know their number. Many say three, and maybe your nativity set at home has three. We don't know their names. Oh, there have been some names in songs attributed to them. The ones you probably hear the most are Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. We don't know exactly where they came from. They saw his star in the east. But we do know that they were Gentiles. They were not from the nation of Israel. And the lesson on Epiphany Day is that all are welcome. That's the thing not to forget. All are welcome. And this is very meaningful for us as well. There are some births that you would not be welcome to. You know, for example, there are celebrities who've had some births recently. Maybe you heard last week Janet Jackson had a son. Had her first child at age 50. She had a son, Isa. If you went and knocked on their door, do you think you would be let in to see the child? Parents, do you think you would let some strangers come in to see your children? I, I don't think you'd be welcome there. Or the royals. Maybe you like to watch the royals over in England. And you know that um, <clears throat> uh, Kate, the princess, has had some, some children with Prince William, the young family over there with the royals. Now they've had George and Charlotte. But if you went over to Buckingham Palace and knocked on the door there, would you think you'd be let in? Think you could see the young family? I don't think so. You're not welcome there. You're not royalty. You're not good enough. In a much bigger way, we shouldn't be welcome to come and see this newborn king. We shouldn't be because we're sinners through and through with a sinful nature, under God's wrath, under his condemnation. We don't deserve to come and see the newborn king. Yet shepherds did from Israel. And now today, the wise men, the magi from afar, Gentiles also came. How true it is in Isaiah 60 where it said, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And the only reason that we could ever come to see this king is because of what he would do later in his ministry. Where he would take your sins and he would pay for them. Where he would erase them. Where he would get rid of them on the cross forever by paying their price before his heavenly father. And he would rise again victoriously to seal your salvation. That's the only reason you can have a white robe of righteousness to appear before God at all. But all are welcome. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We see a second point on our epiphany star today where we read in verse 3, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. This is the prophet Micah. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people, Israel. Well, as we said with the children before, the star was the first thing that led these wise men. And we, we have questions about the star, this mysterious account. You know, what kind of star was it? And was it a natural star? Was it a specially created star? Some commentators say God sent a comet or maybe a convergence of planets. And how did they know this was a star to follow? Was there a vision that was revealed to them? Was there an angel that appeared to them? We, we just don't know. But we do know this. The star went away. The star disappeared. The star didn't lead them all the way. Where did they have to look? to find this new Messiah? They had to look in the Word. They had to look in the Old Testament prophets where Bethlehem was pointed out as the place where the child was to be born. Why is this important to us? Because God hasn't promised you stars. He hasn't promised you visions. He hasn't promised you shining lights. He could appear in one if he wanted to, but his surefire way that he appears is in his Word. In the new year, be led by the Word. Resolve to be led by the word and to be in the word of God also as it led the wise men too. You know, the world's not going to have too much wisdom to offer you. 
Can you imagine if we got a little round table discussion going with some of the community leaders of Fresno and some of the politicians and some of the educators and some of the, the high and mighty and highfalutin of Fresno or California, get them on a panel to tell us what the meaning of life is, what the purpose of life is, what the way to happiness is? I almost shudder to think of what would come out of that discussion. The way that we are led to true happiness, satisfaction, and salvation is in the word of God. Therefore, I have a couple suggestions for you. How about in 2017, you read the whole book? Have you ever read the whole book? Have you ever read it cover to cover? It takes about 12 minutes a day for a year. Could you invest 12 minutes a day to read through the whole salvation story as God has revealed it? <clears throat> I have some programs you could follow, many online as well that you could search out. And a second thing I'd suggest to you is if you haven't in your Bible a lot and read it, maybe seek out a new way to be exposed to the Word. Have you ever heard it read? Lots of audio programs that you can listen to in the car or at home. Maybe you could listen to and watch that uh, Wells Daily Video Devotion. There's a three-minute devotion called Your Time of Grace every day put on the Wells website, and we post many of them on our Facebook page. Maybe watch some of those or maybe you could log in for the 15-minute chapel service at any one of our worker training schools. All four of our worker training schools put their daily chapel online. 15-minute devotion and singing in the background. Find a new way to be touched by the Word because this is how the Lord leads us. We see a third point on our star today in verse 11 where it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. That might not seem like such a profound verse at first, but questions arise, mysterious questions. How, how far did they come? What was the distance? How long were they traveling? A year or two years? And as they came, how did they travel? We often see them with camels, could very well have been, but we, we just really don't know those answers. But we do know this. They came to worship and what a sight that would have been in the eastern custom eye contact would have been at a minimum but reverence and awe would have been at a maximum and we hear about the joy that they had as they worshiped and we see that they fell prostrate before this child and bowed down and worshiped him and what a sight that would have been to have seen those kings those magi, those educated men from the east do this. And we wonder how, what Mary and Joseph were, had on their faces as they were watching all of this unfold. But they were not ashamed to worship. Therefore, our third point today is, in the new year, be determined to worship. Come and worship the newborn king and the one whose life we will recount in the epiphany season. I know many of you have been regular worshipers in your whole life, but there can be temptations toward excuses not to worship. Busyness. I'm not too busy. Do you know what I have to do this week? It's busy, busy. I've got much to do. I've got to work on the house. I have to run errands. I've got to do this. And sometimes that might even be a temptation to infringe on your worship. And the distance. Oh, it's too far to come. Don't tell the wise men that, though. Too far to come, and you know the price of gas these days, and I'm driving around all week, and I can't drive around on, on Sunday morning. Or sometimes the temptation can be to come into God's house a bit casually. How would you prepare yourself if you were going to meet the Queen of England or the President of the United States or someone who was, uh, someone who was well known? How would you prepare yourself to meet the King of Kings? Come into God's house with that reverence and awe as well as you come to worship. Or sometimes worship can become a bit rote and a bit routine, and there definitely is a structure to every one of our worship services that, that it follows, and maybe it can be second nature or old hat, but maybe it's a time to rejuvenate yourself with why we do the things we do in a worship service with confession and absolution and praise and prayer and sacrament. In the new year, be determined to worship. We see a fourth point on our star in verse 11 where then it says, And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All oh, the gifts. The gifts they brought. People of 
tried to guess what the meanings were behind the gifts, and I think there's some good speculation out there. Gold is surely fitting for a king. <clears throat> Incense is surely uh, representative of his deity, divinity. This is God, and our prayers and incense go together. And myrrh, well, that's a perfume. It's, in, it's something to be a medicine, can embalm even the dead. Definitely maybe a reference to his humanity. But regardless, they brought their gifts, and they brought them naturally to the king. And look at how they brought their gifts. They brought them generously, and they planned their gift. Definitely a first fruit gift and a sacrificial gift. And what a lesson for us to also bring our offerings to the newborn king as well. We can think about that as the new year lies ahead. When it comes to bringing our offerings, there can be a lot of temptations. There can be a lot of temptations with thinking of a lack of trust. Uh, will God provide for me if I bring my offering sacrificially and generously and my first fruit offering? There can be a temptation to say, it's, it's my money, it's what I earned, it's mine, rather than remembering the good giver who gives all good things. Sometimes it can be a temptation to be out of, out of balance with the things that we spend on ourselves, luxuries and frivolous things and the offerings that we bring to God's house. It can be a temptation to bring our leftovers. It can also be a temptation not to be cheerful, happy as we bring our offerings to the Lord. But that's a time to remember why we give our offerings. It's a natural thing. Something that was, simply comes from a heart of faith because of what the Lord has done for us. And also we see what our offerings go toward. God's ministry in the world. The kingdom of God. The ministry of our church. The enlarging, God willing, of, our, of the kingdom among us. This is what we contribute to together. And there are opportunities in those boxes of envelopes that are given out each year. I had a little note in the, those boxes this year. I don't know if you read it, but it talked about how those are opportunities. It's not a duty. It's nothing with guilt. But it's an opportunity, not only to show your trust to the Lord, show your faith to the Lord that he'll provide, and also an opportunity for us together to do the work that God has put in front of us here in the Clovis Fresno area. It's an opportunity to show our faith and to give like the Magi did. And then we come to the last point on our star today in verse 12, where it says, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Herod lied to them. Herod lied to them and said, You go find the king, come back to me, tell me where he is, because I want to worship him. And that was a lie. And we saw in the reading last Sunday, the gospel lesson, what Herod's true feelings were. He wanted to obliterate the newborn king. He did not want any threats to his kingship. So what did the Lord do? He instructed them not to go back to Herod, but to quietly go another way home. And they obeyed the voice of the Lord. That may seem simple, but do you think there was a little bit of anxiety in their minds? Could have been a little dangerous to defy the king and go another route. And who, who could he come after them with? And and yet they obeyed the voice that spoke to them. In the new year, you will hear many voices as well. Which voice will you follow? There are voices around us in the world. There are choices to make every day. We resolve to obey God's voice. Despite repercussions, despite criticism, despite ridicule, despite danger, we follow the Lord's voice in the new year. We might be tempted to follow our own sinful nature even at times and make decisions out of anger or greed or dishonesty or envy, immorality, hate, weakness. But those are not the voices to follow even in your own sinful nature. The voice to follow is the Lord's voice. And it is to do it not out of guilt again or duty, but because, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, <clears throat> Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So we've come to the end of the mysterious account 
All kinds of questions that could be going on in our minds. But may we remember the important points of Epiphany, the star points that are really the main point. How in the new year, all are welcome to come to God's house. Be led by the word in various ways. Be determined to worship. Bring your offerings that you decide and obey the voice of the Lord. And as we do that, may we be motivated by the same faith and love that those magi had long ago. And may we also know that one day you're going to meet the magi. You're going to see the wise men as we gather around the throne of God and maybe have some of those questions answered in this mysterious account as we worship the newborn king and the saving king forever. Amen.